The story begins with a young girl. She loves reading, school, and the cat she named French Fry when she was eight. She doesn't know how to use her body and knows even less about how it works, a fact which becomes increasingly apparent the morning she wakes to find blood stains on her sheets. At first, she thinks she's dying. Who wouldn't? But soon learns from her mother that she is becoming a woman now, and more importantly, definitely not dying. My adolescent years were painful, awkward, and bloody. Nonetheless, I learned how to wash the stains from my sheets and take care of my body when it was hurting. I learned that becoming a woman was something to be celebrated, but quietly. The first time a man asked me if it was my time of the month, I realized womanhood wasn't such a secret after all. Menstruation was a hushed topic simply because it made people uncomfortable. To him, my period was a shameful, unfamiliar process, and it is not hard for the unfamiliar to become threatening, especially when it bleeds. A woman's time of the month, first time, and biological clock are used by society to dictate womanhood. Her period can discredit her words and emotions, her sexual activity and desire are seen as direct reflections of her morality, and her stance on motherhood determines her value. Each of these experiences involve pain to some degree, but because this pain is so deeply associated with becoming a woman, it is unfamiliar to the patriarchal society and is therefore a threat in need of controlling. It is difficult, however, to try and control something that is so persistent. Women's pain is timeless. It is present each month whether society deems it acceptable or not. It pervades socially accepted rules and regulations because it adheres to a timeline, a cycle, if you will, that is all its own. So, what does the patriarchal society do when it is unable to control women's time? It writes a story that punishes it instead. Fairy tales, too, are timeless. They have a way of returning, repeating, and retelling themselves. Rather than becoming stale, forgotten relics of the past, these stories evolve with society, changing to espouse the current favored ideologies. Fairy tales, then, use character archetypes such as the fair maiden, the heroic prince, and the wicked witch to reflect, quote, the dominant interests of social groups that control cultural forces of production and reproduction, end quote. For instance, in the original tale of Little Snow White, the evil queen tries to kill Snow White because she is jealous of the young girl's growing beauty. Snow White narrowly escapes the queen's first attempt and ends up keeping house for the seven dwarves, a pretty picture of domesticity. The queen's second attempt is much more successful. By turning herself into an old peasant woman, she is able to trick Snow White into eating a poisoned apple. Unfortunately for the queen, the power of her magic is no match for the prince. With one kiss, the male figure restores order and Snow White lives. The story ends with the queen being forced to wear hot iron shoes and dance until she falls down dead. Throughout the tale, Snow White's character is constantly juxtaposed with the evil queen, thus implying female obedience will be rewarded, while disobedience will have grotesque and even deadly consequences. For instance, the story positions aging as an act of disobedience, through the queen's use of an elderly appearance to deceive and kill Snow White. Here, growing old and beauty are contradictory traits, effectively vilifying the aging woman, a process dictated entirely by time, and asserting young women as the only acceptable form of womanhood. The prince's part in the story is small but integral. By correcting the chaos caused by the queen's disobedience and allowing Snow White to live, the prince's role in the story suggests that, without patriarchal order, women are lost. The punishment of women in fairy tales who disobey or defy patriarchal structures is not isolated to the story of Snow White. The same ominous lesson lurks behind almost every enchanted rose and fairy godmother. Conform to this disciplined version of womanhood, and you will survive. In the story, Little Briar Rose, more commonly known as Sleeping Beauty, the princess is cursed by a wise woman to prick her finger on a spindle during her 15th year and fall into a hundred year sleep. Sure enough, on her 15th birthday, Little Briar Rose finds an old woman spinning flax, pricks her finger on the spindle, and falls into a deep sleep along with the rest of the castle's inhabitants. Enter the heroic prince a hundred years later, whose kiss wakes the princess and restores order to the kingdom. From the emphasis on a young girl's curiosity to a king's desperation to protect his daughter from the perils of growing up, this fairy tale suggests themes of adolescence and transition. If viewed through this lens, the spindle drawing little Briar Rose's blood could act as a symbol for menstruation, especially given the context of her age. Her curse, then, is her period, one that is only broken when the prince kisses her, perhaps an allusion to pregnancy, or at the very least, sexual maturity. Once again, a wicked female character disrupts society in such a way that only a male character can correct it. 
Once again, the figure of the aging woman is antagonized by acting as the catalyst for the curse, and once again, women's blood is seen as a threat. In some tales, there is no evil queen or wicked witch in need of controlling. Instead, there is a misguided maiden who must learn how to behave. Little Red Cap follows a young girl on a journey to her grandmother's house. Despite her mother's warning to remain on the path, Little Red Riding Hood wanders into the forest and encounters the big bad wolf. This meeting results in both her and her grandmother getting eaten, a death they narrowly avoid when a huntsman cuts open the wolf's stomach and saves them. The wolf's behavior in the story is eerily similar to that of sexually predatorial men. His lurking in the shadows, deceptive nature, and devouring of both old and young women are all condemned by the fairy tale. The huntsman fills the wolf's belly with heavy stones, resulting in his death. But this story is not aimed at the big bad wolves of the world. It is meant for children. The message of obedience, therefore, is directed entirely toward those who can relate to Little Red Riding Hood, namely young girls. The story suggests that it is in the wolf's nature to eat women. He cannot help it. So it falls on the shoulders of those women to rein in their curiosity and stay on the path laid out for them. In short, if they are eaten, it is their fault for not knowing better. Here is my confession. Despite all the stifling morals, harsh punishments, and unrealistic expectations for women, I love fairy tales. I always have, and I suspect I always will. As I grow and change, so does my admiration for these stories. I once longed for a version of womanhood built on castles and true love, but as Jane Usher states, the pedestal is a precarious place to be. The woman positioned there has to remain perfect in order to avoid falling into the position of monster incarnate. And so, my fascination with that pedestal has slowly shifted into a curiosity for the quiet truth hidden in dark forests and muttered between wicked words. I am in pain, the evil queen seems to say. Are you in pain too? Angela Carter answers this question with a loud and defiant yes. Her collection of fairy tale retellings, entitled The Bloody Chamber, rejects the idea that becoming a woman is a problem to be solved with a pair of glass slippers and a kiss on the lips. The title itself is an act of rebellion. The word bloody implies violence, and paired with the word chamber, it becomes a clear reference to, quote, the apparently uncontained fecund body, with its creases and curves, secretions and seepages, as well as its changing boundaries at times of pregnancy and menopause, all which signify association with the animal world and stand as the antithesis of the clean, contained, proper body, which is epitomized by the body of man or the prepubescent girl, end quote. By allowing this reference to encompass her fairy tale retellings, Carter establishes that she is aware womanhood is perceived as a threat. Indeed, quote, representations of the vagina dentata, the vagina with teeth, transform dread of the vagina into myth. The fecund body as the mouth of hell, a terrifying symbol of woman as the devil's gateway, end quote, illustrates the cultural anxiety that the female body is a monstrous entity. Instead of shying away from it, however, the title implies Carter will address it directly. It implies she will nurture it. Carter's suggestion that a free woman in an unfree society will be a monster is present in each story of the collection. Between countesses with a taste for blood, girls who are more wolf than woman, and maidens who willingly turn themselves into beasts, Carter embraces the idea that becoming a woman is a violent, threatening, and monstrous process. Her fairy tale heroines are far from the glittering perfection of their traditional roles. They are flawed, and they are wild, and they are bloody, but, more importantly, they are free. The bloody chamber allows women's time to expand, much like a mother's womb, stretching to make room for the character's pain and desires. Oftentimes in Carter's stories, time is associated with blood, particularly that of the menstrual cycle. This is a direct critique of the idea that, quote, for some, the unruly menstrual body marks the end of the illusion that a girl is the same as, as good as, a boy. This can be experienced as a loss of power." End quote. Rather than monarchy symbolizing the end of a girl's freedom from her body, Carter asserts it as the beginning. For instance, in A Company of Wolves, the protagonist's period is described as a clock that will govern the rest of her time. In Wolf Alice, the protagonist's conception of time begins with her first cycle. The Lady of the House of Love depicts a woman trapped in time who is only freed when she herself leads. It follows, then, that the notion of becoming a woman in Carter's retellings not only produces pain and blood, but time as well. Through this notion, the stories establish that women experience time in a way that is completely separate to men, a foundation upon which violence inevitably emerges. 
Angela Carter does not hesitate to depict womanhood as it is, a bloody, painful process, but she also does not erase society's fear of it either. Both men and women in the bloody chamber attempt to dictate women's time, the results of which are never pretty. Here, Carter understands that women, quote, experience these differing temporal orders outside any pre-established and socially regulated hierarchy, end quote, and suggests that the ultimate punishment occurs when women are prevented from experiencing time organically. Temporality in the bloody chamber, then, can be portrayed as both a tool of empowerment and confinement, depending on who wields it. Carter once wrote, I desire, therefore I exist. It is a powerful statement, one which defies the underlying threat associated with the unfamiliarity of female desire. Instead of locking her desires away, she allows them to define her existence. She exists because of them, not despite them. With her clever lyrical prose, Angela Carter encourages us to do the same. We are invited into the bloody chamber, where she provides the time and space to express the pain, the blood, and the desire. Here, becoming a woman is a thing to be celebrated and loudly. Here, between the book's pages, we too are allowed to exist. Thank you.